Here at Talk Sport today, absolutely thrilled to be in the company of Ryan Mason, who has uh, gone through the mill, it is fair to say, since January, when an incident, one specific incident in a match, changed the course of his, his life, his career, the course of everything. First things first, Ryan, good to see you. How are you feeling? Cheers, Jim. Yeah, um, I feel good. I'm, I'm good. I'm positive. Um, I'm in a good place. Um, yeah, like physically, I feel completely fine. I've been up in Hull for, for the last sort of three or four months now training. Um, I, I'm ready to play, but, but my skull's not quite there yet. So um, I need a little bit more time to, for that to, to fuse together and that. And um, yeah, yeah, I'm feeling good. Your story is an intriguing one. With, with so many twists and turns to it as well, Ryan. So let's get into it. Can you take me back to that match at Stamford Bridge? We're talking Chelsea, we're talking your team, Hull City. And this was the 22nd of January. So what was unfolding on the field of play? How, how was the game going? Well, I remember we started quite positive. Um, Marco Silva come in and... Um, I think we, we were quite confident going into the game that, that we'd get a result. Um, we were organised and I remember the first sort of 10, 15 minutes we started well and and then there was a cross, I think it was Eden Hazard, he um, sort of floated one in and um, yeah, I, fe I felt like I was there on my own and I've backpedalled and I've jumped to, to head the ball and, and get a decent decent distance on it and then yeah, obviously the, the impact came and yeah, it was painful and, and obviously after that it was uh, it was quite a struggle. So there was a, a fearsome clash of heads with yourself and Gary Cahill. Did you see Cahill coming into it? No, that's, that's the thing. It's weird because when you jump for a header, usually you're, you're quite aware what's around you. And if you feel like you need to put your arm up and, and protect yourself or, or sort of just, yeah, like I say, protect yourself. But in that moment, I, I honestly felt like there was no one around me. And yeah, I've really tried to get some distance on it. Um, I think if I felt that someone was there, I'd probably head it back to, to where it came from. But as I felt like I was on my own, I I tried to clear the ball and get a decent distance on it. And um, yeah, the, the impact came. And I remember straight away that, that I knew that it was quite a serious injury because straight away it felt like my, my brain, my skull was sort of bleeding. It felt like it was pouring out of blood. And I remember touching my, my hand and looking at it and there was nothing there. So... Yeah, I did have a li little bit of a panic up then. Did you actually feel, Ryan, from being in the air to dropping back down to the ground, something serious has happened to you? I think it, it probably took sort of three or four seconds for it to sort of hit home what had happened because I remember there being a couple of players over me, but I just, I didn't want anyone near me. It was um, it was a weird sort of pain to, to be going through. My head just felt so like, it's like something had gone off in there. It was, there was so much pressure in there and very painful. And um, I just didn't want anyone near that that point in my head. So, um, yeah, I did know straight away that there was a serious injury. Did you talk to people? Did you keep them back? Were they wanting to talk to you? Yeah, well, um, the doc come on um, from Hull and he said that I was, I was quite combative at first. Um, I didn't want anyone near me. Um, he said for the first couple of minutes, he... I didn't want anyone sort of touching touching my head or, or going anywhere near me. But um, he said instantly he he knew that it was a serious injury that I'd fractured my skull because the right side of my face was completely paralysed. So I couldn't I couldn't move anything. It was just dropped. So yeah, he knew instantly that, that it was a severe injury. And he um, from that point he was planning sort of what hospital I go to because I was quite blessed that there was three or four hospitals within a 20, 30 minute drive of Mm. of Stamford Bridge so yeah, it was important that, that he picked the right one and he did pick the right one we're talking about I, I want to talk to you about this Hull City's doctor Mark Waller yeah I mean I wonder what might have happened if he hadn't been on duty that day or if he hadn't been working or whatever but he was but he took you directly to Paddington is that right to, yes. to, to St Mary's rather than the nearest hospital mm -hmm. so he obviously recognised Ryan my boy here's in a bit of trouble yeah, yeah. Like I said, he, he knew instantly that it was a serious injury, and um, it was quite funny actually because he, he told me that on the Friday before the Sunday game, he was up at St George's Park, and I think every two or three years the, the doctors and, and physios have to to renew some sort of thing for their um, for the license yeah, to work, yeah, basically. Yeah. And yeah. Um, the thing that he got assigned was was head injuries, 
which is crazy. So he <laughs> said he'd come on the pitch and everything was so fresh. He he knew that how bad it was. And um, yeah, I think I think the ambulance people uh, maybe wanted to go to the closer hospital to to scan me there and and see how severe it was. But but Mark, he he knew that that it did need operating on. So we went straight to St Mary's, and I think. I think it was 61 minutes from the accident I was being operated on. So I think that's that's why I've made such a good recovery up to this point because the bleeding on the brain wasn't wasn't in there for for long enough to to cause some serious damage. What do you what do you remember specifically, Ryan, about Mark being with you on your way to to the hospital? I mean, are you still in your kit at this stage? Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, I was fully fully in my kit. Um, I can't really remember too much about Mark being in, in the ambulance but I can remember um my mum and dad were at the game because yeah going to the stadium I remember um we get allocated our tickets so put them in the envelope and, and put their names on it and and their their tickets were in the first row so I, I remember thinking that if I score then then I'm, I'm straight over to them like I know where they're sitting it's going to be um it's going to be quite easy and um yeah unfortunately for them they were they were probably closer than they they should have been to the accident and um they were straight round there. My mum come in the ambulance with me and yeah, I remember being with her and my dad uh, went and picked up the car and, and drove to the hospital. So I think the whole ambulance journey, um, I just remember my mum my speaking to me and trying to keep me positive and, and strong. In that journey, Ryan, it's my understanding the pain subsided a bit. Is that right? Yeah. Were you yeah. aware of all these differing emotions and, and feelings? Yeah, it was quite weird because obviously, like I say, the, the instant pain was was unbearable it, it was um it was awful but as i got closer to the, ho to the hospital in the ambulance the the pain did kind of sort of go away a little bit i was i was feeling a lot more relaxed and i kind of just yeah i was just sitting there a bit a bit in a daze to be honest you were coming and going weren't you i mean you had a kind of out of body experience is that right yeah what, what happened with that yeah well yeah, my, my body was sort of just, just relaxing really and um, it felt quite peaceful and yeah, the last thing I remember in the ambulance, I think it was as soon as we got to the hospital, um, yeah, I've said it before, but I had this out-of-body experience where I was with my partner, my fiance Rachel, and um, we ain't got any kids, but there was there was two kids and we were sort of running on a hill with with our dog as well, so... It's quite a strange thing, to be honest. I think um, a lot of people probably say about it, but, but it does seem a bit bizarre. But yeah, the, the days after the operation, I remember speaking to my family and, and telling them what, what I'd sort of seen. And she's pregnant now, so yeah. Ah, um, yeah. you see, you yeah, see. You yeah, know. yeah. Um, in the, um, the experience, I, I kind of, I see that there was a boy and a girl, um, but the girl was bigger. So <laughs> I'm adamant we're having a little girl. Um, she thinks we're having a boy, but... Yeah, we were gonna have a surprise. And is that still quite vivid? Yeah, yeah. In your mind? It's so clear. It really is so clear, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, the, you must have been thinking, uh oh, where am I going? Where is this taking me? Mm. What is going on? What is going where am I at right now? Yeah, it was it was such a such a weird experience to be in, you know. I think um when I got into the ambulance from the stadium, I remember telling telling my mum and dad just to to contact my, my fiance because she was up in Hull on her own with the dog and she don't usually watch watch the game so I'm sure her phone was going off anyway but um yeah I tried to make sure that, that my parents sort of contacted her and and kept her in the loop of what was happening. And now Rachel's expecting. Yeah, yeah she's um she's six uh, months gone. I love that. I love that Ryan. That's a lovely part of the story. So thereafter what happened? Because you knew then I'm in serious trouble here. No matter what, I'm in trouble. My career's in trouble. I'm in trouble. Yeah, well, um, like I said, I got to the hospital and, and straight away they sent me in for a CT scan to to check on the brain and, and the damage that was done. And I think it, it was quite fortunate, actually, because in the CT scan, apparently I I went unresponsive um, Yeah, in, in, the, in the room and, and they kind of had to rush in and, and put some oxygen in me and... And they took me straight upstairs where the operating theatre was. Um, and the, the actual the neurosurgeon that operated on me, he wasn't in. He was, he was rushing in because he, he was on call out. So, so he was coming in and there was a there was a younger lad uh, and he was pretty inexperienced really. He had to start the operation. So 
he sort of cut me open and and took the the pressure off my my skull because skull. Of the, he cut you off. yeah he cut me open and obviously because like i said there was a lot of bleeding on the brain mm. and um yeah he, he cut me open and um took the pressure off the brain and and then the the more experienced neurosurgeon come in and and done the job when you say you were unresponsive d did you leave us well, uh, i'm not too sure to be honest i think i think maybe um that's what unresponsive is the the oxygen stops getting to your brain and and you stop breathing so um yeah i was really fortunate that that they acted quickly and um they come and put some oxygen in me and uh, took me straight up upstairs to, to be operated on because that's what it suggests to me ryan that mm -hmm. at that particular moment everything stopped yeah yeah well um i think that's what it is yeah i mean um yeah, I, I'm just so lucky that, like I say, it was 61 minutes it took to, to be operated on from, from the football pitch to to the operation start, and it was 61 minutes. So um, the recovery I've made, I think, does massively come to that because the the time that my brain was, was being bled on wasn't as bad as it could have been. Where were, where were mum and dad and Rachel and all of this at that time? Well, my, my best mate, Adam Smith, he, he plays at Bournemouth. Um, yeah, we're best mates. We've been best mates all our life. And um, he knows Rachel because he's partners with her best mate. So, so we're all quite quite a tight unit. So he, he phoned up a, a car straight away and um, stuck her in a car. And she was with the dog and they, they were making their way home. Um, my mum and dad were obviously at the hospital waiting for me to, to come out of theatre. So the upshot of it was, am I right, 14 metal plates? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the sky, I mean, I'm looking at you now. I know you and I are in talk sport, we're in radio. <laughs> people, people can hear us, but not see us. I don't see any visible scarring. Seems to be concealed very nicely by your hair. Um, 42 staples. I mm -hmm. mean, this was enormous, extensive surgery, wasn't it? Yeah, it was massive. Um, I've seen numerous surgeons since since the operation to sort of get their opinion on it and they've kind of said it's probably the worst head injury they've seen in a sports sports um, activity they said the only times you sort of see this injury is um in a car accident or something like that so um yeah the job the the surgeon has done on me is is pretty amazing to be fair i've still got a bit of muscle wastage on the side that, that hopefully is going to come back through strength and that but um yeah, the recovery I've made is it's all positive. Am I right in thinking you're still chewing gum just for the heck of it? <laughs> yeah. To get think to, to get your face moving and Yeah, yeah, it's one of the things that I was told to do to literally constantly chew on that side of the face to to build the muscle up because when they when they cut me open they they slice that muscle. So um obviously that that didn't work for quite a while because I couldn't open my mouth and my jaw was sort of locked. So now I can chew. I'm I'm making the most of it and, and trying to build it back up. And, and you can feed yourself now because Rachel was feeding you with a spoon to start with. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Initially, the first sort of, I'd say the first week in the hospital, I was, I couldn't really open my mouth to be honest. I, I didn't have the strength to, to pick up a glass of water or anything. So I had all my family there and, and my fiance and um, yeah, they, they were feeding me. So that was, that was quite a strange experience. And obviously I come home after eight, eight days in hospital. And then I remember when, I think it was 10 days in we um my, my missus made me breakfast and I went down and I could pick up a, a glass of orange juice for the first time and <laughs> oh, all these things were like a, a massive step the, the sort of things you kind of take for granted and don't even think about but in that moment it, w it was such a, a big deal to be able to to pick up a glass of orange and and drink it myself yeah did you milk it a bit did you keep it going? Did you enjoy being fed by Rachel? I'm still trying now. Good yeah. man. Yeah, Why I'm not? Still tr exactly. Yeah. yeah I think so, that's fair. And I'm making the most of it. Um, yeah, she's um, she's been great. To be fair, she's she's been really good to me. I think these are times that you know talk about stepping up to helping you. I mean, her her help, her assistance, her involvement in this. I I don't know how you'd begin to describe that, Ryan. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing. I think it's it's brought me and everyone close to me um a hell of a lot closer you know when you go through something like this um it does make you realize how how important your family and, and people you love are to you um for the first sort of month I I couldn't really be around anyone you know my my family live sort mm. of two or three minutes from me and that they were desperate to, to come around every day and and see how I was but 
it was difficult because I couldn't really hold a conversation and I was literally sleeping for like 18 to 20 hours a day. So my my mum and dad, my sisters, they would literally pop in and literally open the door into the living room and just be like, are you okay? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm fine. And then that, that'd sort of go off again and and Rach would, would just sit in the living room with no TV, no lights on or anything for, for like the whole day and and just keep an eye on me basically. So um, yeah, the first sort of month was was pretty crazy. So Ryan, clearly, I mean, your skull was shattered in, in, in several places and into several pieces. Was there a specific time that somebody's taken you aside and said, you are actually going to be okay? Um, no, there wasn't, you know, I think um, everyone around me has been so positive. I, I'm quite a positive person anyway. And and in the, the initial sort of six to eight weeks of, of, of having the injury, I, I just... I was in quite a good place mentally, you know. I just, I just, I understand what a positive mindset can can have on recovery and and getting better with things. So everyone around me was was sort of positive that I was going to be okay, and it was just a case of listening to my body and and sleeping as much as I could and and eating as much as I could as well. So um, yeah, I was. Um, I'd like to think I, I dealt with it quite well, and everyone else around me did as well. Since that day. Many people, a lot of people know that I'm talking to you today, Ryan. And it's funny, a lot, a lot of people ask the same question. Ask him, has he been able to watch the incident again? No, no, I, I, don't, I don't see the point, to be honest. I, I remember the incident, so I don't, I don't see why I would, I would watch it again. It's, it's not something I, I want to see, to be honest. I've, I've seen it on adverts. Um, or not adverts on TV a couple of times and I've had to sort of turn away and um, you can kind of hear it on, on some some television. Um, so yeah, I, I don't see why I'd, I'd put myself through watching the, the incident again. Maybe, maybe that'll change in the future, but, yeah. but at the moment I, I don't feel like there's there's any need to to watch it. Can you just not bring yourself to do it? I, like I say, I, I just, I don't feel what benefit I'm going to get from it. Um, I'm in a good place mentally. I have been ever since the injury, so... The only thing that could come out of it w- would be a negative, so I don't want I don't want anything like that to, to sort of go through through my mind. I saw a still picture of it. Have you seen one of them? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I looked at it and I thought, oh, I mean, I got a lump in my throat. Mm-hmm. I can't imagine what you thought. Yes, um, yeah, you can you can tell from the, the image. It, it probably don't look great to be honest. Um, it's his front of his head where yeah. that's the strongest part of the skull and. It's my temple area where I think everyone knows that's the weakest part of the skull. And and like I said earlier, it was um, I think the thing that made it worse was the fact that I didn't feel like anyone was around me. So I've tried to get a good bit of distance on the header. So I've turned my head into his head as well. So that impact impact was was probably doubled. Mm, mm. And since then, you you I think noise is a big thing for you. I read with real interest that you, you went to a match, I think it was a Sunderland match. Mm-hmm. You couldn't cope with the noise that was going on. Yeah. Is that an everyday thing? No, like I'm, I'm completely fine now. Um, initially, the first sort of six, seven weeks, I, I couldn't really couldn't really hold conversations. My energy was low and yeah, I, I couldn't even watch TV. The, the noise and everything was too much. Um, then as your body starts getting better, Everything started to pr- to improve, um, yeah. And, and the first match I went to see was was Hull against Sunderland, the back end of last season. And I took some earplugs with me, and they were some bright orange ones. I was I was a bit a bit embarrassed to stick them in, to be honest. Um, I, I sort of tried to to go without them, but after sort of five minutes, um, I had to stick them in because the noise and everything was was a bit too much. But now I can watch the games, and um, the noise is completely fine. Tell me about Peter Check. Because he's been a, a regular contact since the incident. And of course, we know when he went through. But he's been very helpful, I understand. Yeah, I, um, I can't speak highly, highly enough of him as, as a person, as a man, because straight away he contacted my family, my, my fiancé, and, and, and just sort of reassured us that, that what we were going through was, was sort of normal and, and to be expected with not being able to talk and struggling with the light and, and everything like that. And... Um, as soon as I got a bit more strength, I, I was keen to see him because he said, as soon as you're ready, um, I'd like to come round and speak to you. And yeah, I, th- I think it was like eight, eight or nine weeks. He, he came round and 
<laughs> I was a bit worried at first because I hadn't really spoke to anyone for longer than 10 minutes. And um, he walked through the door and, and sat on my sofa and literally just said, just sit back, don't say anything, just listen. And he spoke for about an hour and a half. Um, I didn't say anything, he just spoke. And it was brilliant to be fair because when he left, my, my partner sort of said, wow, like the things we were a little bit worried about it, it just reassured us that, that everything we was going through was was part of the process of, of recovery. And um, we've been in touch ever since. He he come round again and we speak on the phone regular. So um, yeah, he's he's been fantastic. Do you know that's amazing, Ryan, because it says so much about someone like Czech. He could have got in touch once and left it, mm -hmm. but he didn't. And presumably the detail that he went into has helped you a lot. Yeah, massively. Um, I think he's kind of set the standard of what it, what it is to be a, a proper man and a gentleman. Um, I'm sure if someone goes through that again, um, we'll be fighting to to be there for him, to support him, because the strength it gave me here and him, I understand that how much of a positive impact it can have on someone. So I'm hoping no one ever does go through that sort of injury again in sports. But um, if they go through something sil similar, then, then I'd be there like Petter was for me. Ryan, here's the thing. Someone will go through this again. That's the bottom line. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it involves contact between player and player. We know that. So it will befall some poor individual again. That, it makes me think, what can the authorities do that they're not doing? What, what more can they possibly do to help eliminate what happened to Ryan Mason? I think it's quite difficult, to be honest. That, that kind of thing, it, it happens so rare. I mean, you look at the amount of aerial challenges that, that go on in a football match and the amount of head injuries, it, it is really low. I mean, unless you start saying people can't head the ball or you, everyone has to wear protection, then I don't think it's ever going to change. Um, you're never going to take heading out of the game because it's a massive part of the game. And maybe in, in the future, people might have to wear head protection. I don't know. But I don't think anything can be done more to, to prevent this kind of thing. It's, it's just a freak accident that this one in... A billion, probably. It's, it's, it's a very low percentage of, of it happening to people. I mean, Peter Cech decided to go with the head protection, but for outfield players, mm -hmm. I cannot see it, can you? I hope so. <laughs> do, 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 yeah. do you think that? You... Yeah, well, um, Hull, the doctor, has spoke to, to the PFA and the FA, and they've, they've given me the all clear on, on one protection, one sort of head protection, because um, I do feel like I probably will need it. I don't think my, my family would would allow me to, to be on a football pitch with, without that sort of protection because for their peace of mind as well, um, that would be a massive thing. So, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I'll, I'll end up wearing some sort of protection. So if, if you are, to, and I want to go on to this with you because this is serious, we want you back. Mm -hmm. You want to come back. Mm -hmm. But the only way you would come back is if you play with head protection. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think uh, the doctor, every, everyone I've spoke to has has said that, that I should should wear some sort of protection on my head and I've got no problem with that. That's if I if I can get back on the pitch safely and and play again then that's that's no problem to me at all. Where are you at then at the moment? Right now when are you thinking right, a bit of training, when are you thinking about getting back into it and seriously returning to the game? It's it's quite difficult to answer to be honest because um, I think sort of six weeks ago, six or eight weeks ago, I was I was ready. I thought that I'd be I thought that I'd be playing now to be honest. And I had a repeat CT scan and it kind of said that the fractures and and the gaps in the skull hadn't quite fused together as much as they would have liked. So um, that kind of got put on a back step at the moment. But um, I'm there physically. I, I'm I'm com completely fine. Um, me and the club were going to rescan at some point in in the near future and and see how much healing has has gone on then and as soon as my skulls fuse together and strong enough which which hopefully it won't be too long then then I'll be back out there because I've had so much time to focus on my body and and be physically ready that that I'm there yeah did you doubt it at any time that you'd be talking so positively about coming back Ryan there must have been a time you thought right that's it, it's over yeah, of it's course. It's a different career um, for me now. Yeah, I'd be lying if initially, probably the first six or eight weeks, I, I was sitting there thinking, how am I going to be able to walk again, let alone play play again on a football pitch? But the 
the body the bo- body does amazing things when when it needs to um it recovers it it knows what to do and it's surreal really what what the body can do so um as soon as I started walking again and, and being able to jog then yeah there was only one thing in my mind that that I was obsessed with with coming back and, and giving myself the best chance to play again so they've just got to give you the thumbs up as to when the skull is totally fused back together yeah I mean um that could take a while but with the protection um it just needs to be a little bit better you know that there there still is a little bit of healing to be done i mean we're only eight months into the injury um if someone snaps their shin bone in half then after eight months you're not really going to be thinking about playing again so um just like i said earlier i just got to respect the body and, and let it heal naturally and the club have been great with me they're they're patient and um they're waiting as well i'm i'm sure they want me back playing um just as much as I do so um, yeah hopefully the next scan I have it will show a lot more healing and we'll go from there what about the supporters I understand there's a lot of love for you quite quite understandably from supporters to, to yourself because of what happened but not just from Hull from it Tottenham from everywhere throughout the country yeah it's been um, it's been quite an experience to be fair uh, the messages and, and the support I've received have been quite over, overwhelming at times um it really does help you. I mean, when when you're sitting at home um, struggling to walk and, and stuff like that, and I got cards through, obviously, on, on social media as well. I got emails. I got absolutely everything. And my missus, my mum my, my and dad, my family would sort of go through the messages and, and read them out. And the strength it does give you to, to come back is um, it's massive. And um, I appreciate every single one of the messages that I received. And from other, I mean, we mentioned Czech, other big name players, anyone you go, oh my God, didn't expect him to get in touch. Yeah, there, there's so many. Um, I'd be I'd be doing people uh, injustice if, if I started naming a few because there was um, there was there was loads of, of current players and past players that have messaged me and um, managers. Me all the best. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, there's just been too many people to name, to be honest. It's um, been brilliant. I look at you now, Ryan, and it's going along well. The story is going along well. <clears throat> How will you feel? And you're back in the field to play again. And you're playing at the level that you were playing at. And you know what I'm going to ask you. And you're wearing the protection. But there's a high ball. And he's coming right at you like a train. Well, I don't, I don't think I'd put myself on a football pitch if, if I wasn't to feel comfortable with going into a challenge like that. Um, the plan is to to train with the helmet on and and get used to wearing it and, and get used to challenging in in positions that, that might seem a bit weird at first. But I'm confident that, that once I'm on the football pitch, I'm fit, I'm, I've been given the all clear, then it won't be a problem. There's no way you'd duck out of it. I mean, I, it's understandable I mean, if you did. Listen, I, I don't think I'm going to be silly. Some people put their head in positions that... That quite dangerous not to other players but but to himself as well I mean I'd probably be a bit more sensible I, I look at some players now and some players don't even head the ball you know I think some players use their body and try and bring it down or or avoid it um I'm always going to be a player that, that does head the ball because that's my position and, and that's, that's the way I play the game but um like I said I wouldn't I wouldn't put myself on a football pitch unless I felt 100% comfortable and confident in challenging for an aerial ball you, you could never have been confident that you'd be talking in these terms just a few months down the line like this Ryan that you'd go back on it and you would be prepared to commit a hundred percent I mean that to me is incredible that you're being so bra- brave so realistic about this it says so much about you yeah I think it comes down to how good I'm feeling physically you know I my brain is completely fine. It's it's literally just a bit of bone that that needs fusing together, and then I'll be where I was before the injury. I'll, I'll be exactly the same person. I'll be exactly the same player. So, well, hopefully a better player because I've had a lot of time to to work on my body and and study the game. And um, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to to getting back out there and and kicking on. Any hard feelings at all towards Cahill? No, I think I think you can look at anything and and say he shouldn't have done this, and I could sit there and have that kind of mindset and that view on it. But things happen in football. It, it was an accident. Not for one minute do I think that he meant to to clash heads with me. Um, 
So he's, just, he's a great lad anyway. He's a lovely guy, isn't he? It's just it's just part of the like game. That. Um, it's just one of those things that that's happened, and um, I'm eager to just move on from it and, and think positive. It's amazing. I mean, at 26, you're actually telling me that in 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 football terms, your best years could yet still to come. Yeah, I, I fully believe that. I, I was always a Anyone who knew me in, in Tottenham youth teams and that knew that I was a late developer. Um, I made my my Tottenham debut at 23, um, albeit a bit late. I think it probably should have been a couple of years before that, but there was always a, a long-term plan with me. Um, I think you see it similar with players. Like, the one that springs to mind would be Jesse Lingard at, at Manchester United. Um, he's had a lot of loans and, and now he, he's part of the, the first team squad at a later age to, than some other people. Um, I feel like I've got the body to to go and play on for for a very long time. I'm um, I'm a fit lad and I eat right. I, I do the right things outside of football as well. So I still think I've got another ten years in the game. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to coming back and I I do strongly believe that my best years are are still to come. It's it, it is it's a very topical subject. I mean, you'll be aware Kevin Doyle this week has retired, mm-hmm. of course, over in the US because. He took a few head knock. The ball cannoned off his head a few times. And he was suffering from real, real problem headaches. And he's decided to retire altogether. Mm-hmm. And then I look at you and I hear what you've come through and we see and we read what you've come through. And for you to be considering coming back at the highest level you can possibly play is one hell of a brave decision to make, Ryan. Yeah, I'm sure if I was 32, 33, sitting in this position, then I'd probably, I'd probably think about maybe calling it a day. But I still feel physically and mentally I've got so much to give. I've got so much to give in the game. And I think I'd be doing myself a bit of an injustice if, if, if I was to, to call it a day now because I'd always think for the rest of my life that I could have played again. And I don't, I don't want to live my life having regrets like that because that would be a massive one. I reckon... Now, you probably, more than anyone I could meet at the moment, is absolutely hell-bent in having the greatest possible life he can have from this point onwards. You're out to fulfil your life, aren't you? Yeah, and not just in football. I mean... Yes. Yeah, yeah, life. Every which way. Yes, it's had a massive impact um, on my family as well, everyone close to me, um, in a positive way. You know, initially it was... It was hell for them, for for everyone close to me. But but now I think um, you do view life in a completely different way when when you've been through something like that. You you start appreciating things uh, that maybe in the past you you didn't as much. But yeah, now I I'm probably happier than I've ever been to be honest. Um, I'm in a great relationship. My my family are great. We're all close, and um, yeah, life's life's very good. Who finally would you want to thank, Ryan? Is there any any and obviously, mum and dad, obviously, I'm sure, Rachel. Who, who specifically do you want to thank for getting you, helping you to the stage you're at today here at TalkSport talking to me? Um, I'd probably have to say a doctor at Hull because the decisions that he made um, were vital in, in me recovering to, to the position that I'm in. I think, um, obviously, I've, I don't mean to blow my own trumpet, but... I think a lot of it might be down to me as well in, in my mindset and and the positivity that, that I've kind of had throughout the injury. But without those initial decisions to be made, they might have been different and it, it, it might have been a, a lot worse. An injury and um, yeah, I'd say I'd say Mark uh, Mark Waller at Hull, the doctor. He's um, he's been fantastic ever since. He's uh, my family love him. My, my fiance loves him. Everyone loves him because. Uh, like I say, the decisions that he made on that night were, were massive. Mate, I don't know if Hull needs you. They won six one the other night, did they not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they um they've been a bit up and down this year. Um we've got a lot a lot of new players in. Um we had a lot of players leave in the summer, as as everyone knows, and mm. it's probably gonna take a little bit of time to gel. We've we've had some good results at home where sort of all, all clicked together and um the manager's working hard, the players are working hard and yeah, I'm sure we'll um, we'll kick on and and have a good season. Ryan, can you imagine just finally the outpouring of emotion from everybody towards you on the occasion that you actually get back and play 
Are you prepared for that? There's going to be an enormous outpouring of love for you. Yes, um, it's it's a dream. Like I, as a, as a lad, my dream was always to play for Tottenham. It was always to play for England, and I kind of fulfilled those dreams. And um, ever since the injury, uh, when I go to bed thinking about football and thinking about playing again, that's I do feel like a little kid again in in some senses. And if I can can come back to play at the highest level, then yeah, it'd just be a, a surreal sort of, of life. I, I'll appreciate every minute that I spend on the football pitch and um, I'm pretty confident that's going to happen. And how to get promoted this season? Fingers crossed, yeah. Hopefully, uh, championship's a little bit of a lottery, to be fair. Uh, the, the level of difference between probably all, all teams, it isn't much, to be honest. It's just uh, the few teams that, that put a run together and be consistent throughout the year. Um, I'm sure we'll... We'll be up there with a chance if, if we can get a bit of consistency and the boys sort of gel together as as quickly as they should. So, um, yeah, hopefully. Ryan, I mean, with all sincerity, you're an incredible young guy. And we wish you well. Everybody here at TalkSport wishes you well. And we want to see you back. And you're such a brave, brave man. You're probably being told this a lot at the moment, but you truly are. And we salute you for everything you've done. No, cheers, Jim. I appreciate it. Thank you.